coming up this week. You will generally find 208 three phase more commonly available within US infrastructure. Um, it's been around on the grid longer. 480 is a little bit newer. It's costs more, longer lead times, higher voltage. And then in order to make up that gap, you're often finding people are putting more chargers in to fit that, um, you know, the, the cost of installation, the cost of upgrade. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to episode 190 of the EV Resource Podcast. I'm Zach Hurst, and each week I bring you the latest EV news, information, and interviews with industry experts. This week, I have an interview with Alex Urist. He is the Vice President of X-Charge for North America. Alex, welcome to the EV Resource Podcast. Thanks, Zach. Great to be here. So I know we're going to be talking about overall the state of the EV charging landscape across North America, especially with some of the latest happenings of Tesla making an announcement and FreeWire, and I know you actually have an announcement that we'll be putting into the mix as well towards the end. Before we really dive into all of that, I like to give my guests an opportunity to share with the audience a little bit about who they are and their background and how they got to their current position. Definitely. Um, so yeah, it's great to be here, Zach, and thanks for having me on. And you know, excited to dig a little bit deeper into some of those topics there. And just to preface for early on in the listeners here, uh, no scary news in that fashion of anything we're about to announce. Uh, just by the, the two forward uh, announcements, anywho, um, nothing scary there. Uh, my background: I come from uh, a history of working in startups um, and you know helping scale startups from early stage up to to later stage. My background starting in the EV industry came back. Uh, around 2020, uh, where I helped to co-found a CPO or ChargePoint operator, along with our president and uh, my co-founder, Atish Patel, um, president of XCharge North America. Um, we were mainly focused on the hospitality sector, uh, very much you know, looking at scaling up uh, within uh, hotels, restaurants, um, quick serve restaurants, and, and looking within those realms. Um, worked with a number of manufacturers or looked towards them. Um, came across XCharge and you know helped to develop the 208 solution that we deploy today, um, and since then have you know been building up that uh, product here in the U.S. So um, you know that was about 2020, early COVID when we started to look into that, and since then um, you know have been involved heavily in the industry. Definitely some experience and well qualified to talk about how things are going across the continent, really for EV charging. There are a number of different ways that we could take this conversation. I would like to just focus on DC fast charging. Uh, while that's not the majority of actual equipment that's needed out there, that is, for lack of a better way of putting it, the flashy stuff. That's where the headlines are going to be. And ultimately, if you have more DC fast chargers, it gives you more ability to offer options for the end consumer. I think it's all about intent and purpose of, you know, what you're looking to accomplish with your goals of charging within that that realm, right? I think there is most certainly a place for L2. Background on X charge as a whole, you know, um, we started off primarily in the L2 arena, have quickly moved into DC fast charging and, you know, don't work in L2 uh, anymore. Um, a lot of that, you know, rationale being that we're, primarily focused on high power charging mm -hmm. and what we're looking to accomplish in that realm. And particularly when we look in the future of, you know, battery integrated assets and, and looking at battery integrated charging and what's possible there, um, that's where we're very, you know, optimistic about the future of charging and what can be accomplished from grid constrained areas. Um, the L2 predicament is, I think it's about perceptive availability of charging. Um, L2 helps to get that pushed over the the hump. I think particularly from the independent aspect in the L2 arena, mm -hmm. home charging, office charging, or rather workplace charging, or kind of, and then multifamily are really the three key. Um, hospitality comes into that. Obviously, background coming from the CPO space and hospitality run into that eternal predicament of should I have a charger that's going to going to charge cars in 30 minutes to an hour, or should I have a charger on site that's going to service my customers who are staying there overnight so they can wake up with a full charge right right and like what is the relative utility that you get out of that when thinking about you know the fast charge versus the slow charge and then what is your roi schedule on that charging ain't free and it shouldn't be free <laughs> right right charging is a business and we need to make sure that the economics makes sense for those businesses along the way 
Um, so I think Absolutely. there's like, that's the eternal predicament. And, you know, one thing that we're very interested, especially in the U S case of getting the right infrastructure solutions in place for, you know, the means or the end means of what that, that charging, uh, site is looking for. So are they looking to push, you know, tens or dozens of cars through that site per day, or do they just need to satisfy a few charges per day? Are they charging a fleet? Are they charging the public? And our hardware can all help to you know, get to that as well. Mm-hmm. 90% of the chargers that need to be built are likely L2, where cars are spent parked for an extended period of time. Um, so yes, absolutely. I, I definitely would agree with that. Recently, there's been some conversations, I guess, about DC fast charging networks and what is needed to be built out. I mean, certainly that's the focus of the a, a large part of the funding from a federal standpoint with the NEVI program. However, recently, Tesla's kind of had some things happening internally that I definitely think we should touch on because it's left a lot of people in the industry and in the public with a lot of uncertainty about the future of the Tesla supercharger network, or even how that's going to affect the charging landscape overall. So without actually asking a specific question, I'll give you the opportunity to just touch on that from your perspective. I think there, there is so much going on there that we probably don't know. And we can all, you know, uh, create some conjecture towards of what we think is going on. I can, I, and I think I, I'll expand upon Know what I think is going on to a degree. Um, there is a there's an aspect of incentive uh, afoot. I think, um, and not, I'm not talking about public incentive or government incentive and, and how that plays into developing the assets, but I mean it in terms of company incentive. And from that, I mean initially the supercharging network was developed as a tool to sell more cars. Um, it's definitely accomplished that. Tesla certainly occupies the majority of market share. Um, you could probably correct me on the stats. I'm sure you you might have them offhand a little bit more. At one point, it was about 70% of you know EVs on the road or or Teslas. Um, they've kind of accomplished their goal in developing at least the early framework of what EV charging infrastructure is. They're the most successful case. They have the highest uptime. They're the most reliable, the best user experience. Um, but now, with more manufacturers stating that they're going to adopt NACS standards. And with charging manufacturers and CPOs and you know various operators of charging stations needing to add NACS cables, do they need to continue to keep that engine going at the degree it's been going? Because if they aren't looking to continue to make that a different business or you know business on top of what they have, and they already have the framework built out for the charging network, and you can pretty much get where you need to go now in a Tesla without concern, except bar maybe some rural parts of Wyoming, I want to say it is, and like there's a, maybe South there's Dakota. Like there's some, yeah. yeah, there's like a few spots, right? And <laughs> but by and large, you know, 90% of Tesla buyers are probably going to be able to get to go where they want to go, no problem. Tesla definitely the entire purpose of the supercharger network in the very beginning was to support their own vehicles because Really, if we go back 14 years, 12 years, there was no charging infrastructure that was built out for that. And even the non-Tesla networks where you have CCS or Chatabo, it wasn't built out the way certainly it is now or anywhere close to where it needs to be going forward. Yeah, no, that is, I mean, that's entirely true. And I think it's just supporting that aspect there and, and the overall impact that it has on the industry. Right. I mean, it sows doubt in people's minds of, oh, if Tesla's rolling up their charging and you know, charging group, then you know, there must not be much in it or something like that. But that's not really the case. There's other market forces at play. Um, and we can continue to <laughs> continue to go down on those. I, I definitely think there's a, a call into question from the hardware support angle of all these manufacturers that have now, you know, transitioned into or made commitments towards NACS. I mean, it's pre-2025, so they I don't I don't know what those agreements look like and I don't know what the confines of them are. I'm not privy to that, unfortunately. But you know, I wonder if there's a way that they just stick to CCS if there was something that needed to happen there. But there's obviously a calculus that needs to go in their mind of, well, the engines have started to move towards adopting NACS. A lot of the RFPs that have been coming out mm-hmm. specifically call out having NACS on the the chargers or as an option there. 
um, Nevi standards have also adopted and you know uh, just reapplied or reconditioned their RFPs to be towards the NACS standard and CCS. Um, in some cases, needing four cables. I've seen in some RFPs. It's interesting, um, but nonetheless, you know, I think they there is this question of do they need to weigh the 10,000 plus charging stations that are going to be immediately available to their customers or and then you know look at the future of what NACS adoption could be or do they just go back to CCS and know that there are reliable networks that are coming up well reliable networks that are coming up all within the the confines of trying to seek towards that aspect of more reliability on a CCS standard but I still think it's I think it's going to still stick to NAX at least right now I, I don't really see a shake up from that aspect just because Tesla shut things down I think right. the wheels are sort of in motion uh to a certain degree but you know we could people can retrofit that's one of the beautiful things about hardware too yes. um it's possible to retrofit that so that brings from a charging network perspective uh an interesting dynamic because you have to really figure out how many potentially existing connectors or future connectors are going to be NACS compared to CCS and how that affects the charger utilization because you don't want to have less customers using the chargers. You want to make those changes to allow more customers to be able to use the chargers, right? Definitely. And I think the, the rationale up till now has been adapters for NACS and just keep it CCS because that's less reliable going from an NACS to um, CCS, at least what people have experienced thus far, coming out with more adapters, I'm sure. Obviously, the Magic Dock and um, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think that has been kind of the rationale. It's looking at car adoption rates and seeing, you know, what is it looking like locally? What are you seeing anecdotally at your sites in terms of cars that are coming in, um, listening to your customers and, you know, hopefully making your adjustments accordingly? Sure, sure. I definitely want to cover. Uh, Freewire, because we mentioned that. Uh, for those who don't know, and we'll we'll keep this brief, Freewire has closed their headquarters and laid off just about everyone that works there. That leaves a lot of questions for the viability of EV charging for the industry on the surface. Now, people who don't know how Freewire was differentiated in the marketplace. They were heavily dependent on in-charger batteries to store energy to essentially aid level two. That's a very unique approach. I think it's important to, to highlight that that should not reflect on the industry as a whole. In fact, to pivot to all the positive stuff, Alex, how do you see in North America the opportunity for charging companies. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there there are significant opportunities. And actually just to touch back on the I guess on Freewire from a technology perspective, we do have a very similar product and just a kind of a differentiation is in the battery buffering versus battery integration. Um, we manufacture our product called the Net Zero series, which is a battery integrated DC fast charger. It's bi-directional, meaning you can take energy from the grid and you can dispense it back to the grid, which has a slew of, you know, multitude of benefits on top, ancillary grid services, demand response, um, kind of B to G and anything enabled in that respect. Um, I, I think, you know, Freewire was able to, you know, create that market uh, in many ways within the US and, you know, it's, it's a it's very yeah it's it's honestly very sad to see that they're shutting down the the location but i'm optimistic that hopefully there can be a re reconsolidation of some aspect or mm -hmm. um you know move forward that way uh <laughs> positive news within the industry and um i think looking forward i think what what it does you know mark it out or like mark out is uh, a consolidation that was is going to happen within the ev industry or at least is you know bound to happen there are a number of large players, both manufacturers, um, you know, CPOs and the like that, you know, seemingly have inexhaustible capital that they can work with in order to to build or define market. Um, but obviously, it's not inexhaustible, as we've seen recently with with large firms, you know, closing down doors and folks that had a lot of promise and, and optimism around the product. So, 
I think it's just in, interesting to look at what might happen from the consolidation standpoint, be it charge point networks um, consolidating a touch further, be there manufacturing consolidation as well. Um, but, you know, hopefully still getting to the overall, you know, grand goals of what Nevi has outlined and just what we need to accomplish within the, the EV industry as a whole and not creating too much setback um, with these firms closing doors both from the momentum of actual site development. I think that's one of the things that's overlooked perhaps in the Tesla case is that the site development for those sites that they were working on now is shut down. Um, you know, And when that turns back on, it still will take months to get the utility coordination going back up again and coordinating sure. with your EPCs. And there's a lot of wheels that are moving constantly on any given project for you know, an EV infrastructure project um, or for putting in chargers in the ground. It takes a lot. And the second that you turn that that faucet off, um, you know, the well dries up pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a difficult one to move through. What can we say to build consumer confidence about really the EV charging landscape with the assumption that you look at EV charging companies in the past? There has been no publicly traded EV charging company that has been profitable. There've been a few private ones that have claimed they're profitable, but of course we don't get a chance to look at their books really. So the general consensus could be that, well, EV charging isn't profitable and you have all of these incentives from the government to build out sites. So clearly you need that subsidy in order to even do it. But I don't really believe that. And I'm curious to see your response to maybe critics that would look at this and go, why are we even bothering with this? There's no, you can't make money from it and it's doomed to failure. I think it comes back to a lot of the reason why we got into, you know, putting the type of infrastructure that we do in the ground um, and why our product portfolio at XCharge is the way that it is. Um, XCharge North America is the way that it is, is really applying or you know, delivering solutions that are geared towards the North American grid specifically. Um, in many cases, even from a DC fast charging realm, we don't need a, you know, 150, 300 kilowatt charger in every application. Um, so we manufacture a wide spectrum of chargers, which covers anywhere from as little as a software limit to 30 kilowatts, all the way up to uh, 125 kilowatts on 208, um, on 480, three phase, we can go anywhere from, again, as low as 40 kilowatts up to 200 kilowatts. Um, and then uh, actually with another model, our C7, which we just recently released up to 400 kilowatts out um, on 480. And then our net zero series, the bi-directional battery integrated charger, which can uh, work on 480 uh, for as low as 22 kilowatt input and can output up to 194 kilowatts out, which is you know quite considerable given the you know, input requirements on that. So we're looking at, you know, stretching what can be done from an infrastructure perspective. And then from our actual, you know, I think our sales method or from our customer relationship perspective, we're working with folks to determine what is the optimal solution for any given site that they're working on specifically. And, you know, not trying to oversell them, not trying to make something that they have to go to the utility company and get a 2000 KVA transformer in place in order to satisfy the initial goals of what they're trying to accomplish. They might not need that initially. So what can we get in the ground now and scale up a solution over time to to reach the you know end goals? And I think it's that and taking that perception across what we find, you know, in the US as a whole is something that we've been you know very vocal about as far as the solutions that we're deploying. I like everything that you just said. I want to go back and explain a couple of bits for members of the audience that maybe are not as technically familiar with the electrical grid and EV charging the way you and I would be. Um, let's just quickly cover what's the difference between 208 and 483 phase and what is the specific use cases or maybe where would we find one versus the other? Yeah, definitely. So uh, 208 and 483 phase are two types of three phase uh, voltage that you'll find within the US electrical grid. Um, the US grid was designed first, so we're stuck with a few of the shortcomings of uh, a little bit more nascent of a, an electrical grid. They stem off of 120 single phase. Um, so 120, 240, 480, or then 208 when it's set up in a different neutral wire. I 
that I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm going to say full disclosure, but um, you know, at least within when it comes down to the difference of those, you will generally find 208 three phase more commonly available within U.S. infrastructure. Um, it's been around on the grid longer. 480 is a little bit newer. It's obviously higher voltage um, and requires a little bit more from just you know site modification or power being brought to site. Um, generally needs you know a transformer or step up transformer to go to 480, which are less commonly available. Um, costs more, longer lead times, higher voltage, and then in order to make up that gap, you're often finding people are putting more chargers in to fit that um, you know the, the cost of installation, the cost of upgrade. 208, uh, you can generally find across most commercial properties about 95 of 95 percent of commercial locations have 208. That can range anywhere from you know, a hotel, um, which has, you know, capacity of 90 plus rooms, uh, has an AC unit in each room, and that's all 208 infrastructure with a pretty high capacity on it. Um, office buildings, you'll generally find 208. You look at quick serve restaurants, you know, franchises, um, you know, even into department stores, your Walmarts. The Walmart is an interesting one because sometimes you might find 480 there, um, just if it's a large enough building. It really depends on the service and how old that building is as well. Um, 480, you'll generally find more commonly available in industrial applications. Um, so think large CNC machine, generally going to have a 480 uh, hookup in that type of application. So anywhere where you're looking at like warehouses or large, large, large commercial applications. Um, much harder to get the 480 on site, which is you know a big reason why we've adopted the the way that we're the product strategy that we have. And when you say harder, just more complicated and more expensive. More complicated, more expensive, um, and generally longer timeline with the utility companies, given the increase of demand for you know 480 currently, um, as well as just supply constraints of like labor and materials both. Once it's set up. From an end consumer perspective, if I'm an EV owner and I'm plugging into a charger, is am I going to notice a difference between one versus the other when it comes to input voltage? And is there any reason why one would be better than the other for that experience? You'll you'll only see the difference in output, um, just in what's possible. So on 208, naturally, you won't be able to have the the same you know higher end output. Say if you're charting for above you know, above 100 kilowatts out of your charge rate. Um, where there's a benefit in putting these 208 solutions in play is looking at what's currently available from a capacity perspective and getting the solution in place. So like think strip malls, you know, quick serve restaurants, hotels, um, could be a parking lot above ground or, uh, you know, or a parking lot operation as well, or underground rather, I should say. Um, and, you know, places where you don't need to go through this whole just, putting in more infrastructure or like the whole upgrade uh, shebang, I should say. Sure. And when it comes to looking at the industry as a whole, most of what it seems that everybody's talking about is 480. Clearly, you guys are taking a little bit more of a comprehensive approach and one to meet the grid where it is versus requiring some potentially major changes depending on site. What are the reasons that you all went with that route in addition to having 480 instead of perhaps just doing what everybody else is doing? Yeah, I, I think it's similar to why FreeWire addressed the 208 predicament as well, right? It's more commonly available. Um, but the issues there are on the output and what's possible from an output perspective. But you know, changing consumer sentiment or, or thinking about what's actually necessary on site is a, a big thing to, to look at. Um, I think take, for example, uh, we've installed uh, the same 208 unit. And I think actually nearby uh, where you are, Zach, at a, um, a Woodfin pit stop out in New Kent, Virginia. Um, we worked with the Virginia Clean Cities Coalition to go and deploy that with them. Um, and you know that site had 208 on site. Um, it was already pre-wired. It made sense. Um, it was an easy you know, add-on to the site without having to go through the infrastructure work necessary for 480. The property owner wasn't too sure about installing an EV charger on site beforehand, um, you know, made a lot of sense. Similarly, in another scenario, we installed a, or we have a customer down in Louisiana, um, just outside of New Orleans in Harahan, Louisiana, 
that installed a charger on existing capacity. They initially only had 32 kilowatts of or yeah, effectively 32 kilowatts available. Um, we power limited the charger and then we're able to scale that up over time now to being, you know, one of the more commonly used chargers in the area, even though it's a sub, uh, you know, sub 90 kilowatt charger from its total charge rate. So I think it's looking again at intent and purpose of what, what are your goals you're trying to accomplish with your charger and then seeing that there. We obviously want to service higher output. Hence why we developed and manufacture the C7. Um, and we see, you know, just a split of customers and what does a customer need? And part of our sales process is, you know, guiding them through understanding if they're initially looking at the 400 kilowatt charger, what is the actual, you know, intent and use case? And can we scale that back into something that might be within the power range they need? Because if they're looking at using the big boy, the C7, um, they're going to need a lot of power. And we're fully aware that that can be logistically complicated in some cases. So if they're looking for, you know, high output, but less input, we might guide them more towards the net zero series, or if they have 208 on site, or, you know, they just want a 200 kilowatt output, we might guide them towards a C6. So it's just understanding, you know, how that, that goes in between. You have to communicate with potential site host or customer about what is existing in terms of the capability of the supporting grid infrastructure where they are. One example, and yeah, I actually would love to, to bring up this case as well that we've been able to, to see a lot of success in is we work uh, pretty strongly with Hertz across a number of airport locations. Um, and in, within the context of that, we've been able to take this strategy of looking at level two chargers that they've had installed that aren't meeting the needs of their turnover necessary for you know filling the cars up to a uh, sufficient charge rate for getting out the door for their customers. Um, we've gone and looked at situations to replace with one C6 AM on 208, just pretty much using the same power that they were tapped into. And, you know, we look or we're hoping to increase their operational efficiency through that process. So we've been working with them across a number of properties there that has been, you know, quite helpful in getting up and running. And, and that is great news because, especially for car rental, I have had a number of people reach out to me or if I run into them and tell me that they, were given an EV from Hertz when they arrived somewhere because that's all that was available, but it didn't have very much charge on it. And so now they have zero experience with electric vehicles and they're expected to go find charging, have an account and fund that account for charging, use it without knowing anything about how it works. Like having the car fully charged for people is extremely important, especially in how consumers relate with the technology to not be a detriment to their experience. Absolutely. No, I think it's, you know, it's definitely a predicament or, you know, something that they've been looking to solve. Um, and we hope that we can help increase that or help get more customers out for them with a, a higher charge rate. Um, I know it's been very helpful thus far and in some of their locations and excited to expand that a bit further. The it's one one way to learn the the shortfall, <laughs> the shortcomings of being an EV driver, that's for sure. When you get a, a car at like 20% or something and your first goal is to go to a charger. Um but you know I think it's all the learning curve. I've been noticing recently from uh, experiences renting EVs from uh from Hertz is you know looking at at least as I'm exiting they've got some good signs in some of the more EV adoption high areas, be it like Fort Lauderdale or um, I know LA also, they've got a sign on the different networks that you can you know utilize. I think people are getting around to it, but it's very hard for a first time driver and especially somebody who is not expecting to take out an EV. It's just kind of being pulled into the throes of uh, you know having to, to test drive. So. Consumer understanding of charging at a very basic level is extremely important for those types of situations. Definitely, it definitely is. So downloading plug share ahead of time is definitely helpful uh, through that process. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, and, and it goes beyond knowing where they are. I mean, how many times have you seen a Chevy Bolt plug into a 250 or 350 kilowatt charger because the number is higher, so it must be better? Like. Consumer I thought about that one. Has yeah, consumer education on the dash. It should there should be like a 
you know, only, only look for this rate of charge, right? Like your char your car will not charge past this rate. Right. Another good one, but yeah. <laughs> I absolutely love where this conversation is going. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be right back at it. Do you own a business and want to reach EV owners and people interested in electric vehicles? EV Resource is welcoming businesses nationwide, both big and small, to become advertising partners with us across all platforms. For more information, please email Zach at hello at ev-resource.com. The 208 approach, I mean, you had said something there that I found intriguing. They have 240 volt level two chargers, which are a much lower amperage than what you would typically see with DC fast charging. Your comment, however, threw me off because you're saying you're pulling out the level two and installing a, a 208 fast charger in its place. There's more to it than that, right? I mean, you have to rework some of the wiring perhaps or right. look at the switch gear and so on and so forth. So I don't want to necessarily it's not be... just as easy as like yeah rip it out and like pop like, it in on yeah, the same okay. inputs it's it's definitely not that but it is much more simple than evaluating putting in a new transformer putting in a new switch gear putting in a new panel for 480 um, and the costs associated with that and the timelines associated with the utility company effectively what you're looking at you know under the confines of this is they're you know l2s uh, some L2s can be hooked up on 2083 phase. And then, mm -hmm. you know, you're looking at your panel, looking at what panel space is available. Um, and often, you know, you'll take out and re-replace either within the same panel or order a new panel, which, you know, is the cost is negligible when compared to a transformer. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. I mean, transformers, I mean, from the low end around 50, well, maybe 40,000 to wealth into six figures, depending on, you know, how much capacity of power that you actually need. I mean, just, yeah, yeah big time. Oh, yeah. So X-Charge is, we could say, up and coming here in North America. The group headquarters is located in Hamburg, Germany. The North American market is ripe. I mean, there's so much opportunity here. What types of partners or customers are opportunities that you all are identifying to work more closely with as you're looking down the road towards the future? Absolutely. So we've been very fortunate across Europe to work with folks, you know, out of um, utility providers to some of the largest CPOs out in Europe, um, all the way to private companies that are electrifying, you know, fleets, be it municipal fleets or beyond. Um, been very fortunate in that regard. And I think within the US where we've been finding a lot of successes with partners like Hertz um, on the fleet side. It's also looking at uh, our CPO partners or charge point operator partners that are, you know, looking at product supply agreements and utilizing our hardware within their overall stack. And then I think also key for us is offering up a solution that can um, be delivered to an independent business owner. And whether that's delivered by way of some of our partners who offer up, you know, a similar solution with their software and, you know, additional benefits from that software on top um, versus, you know, going by way of us and some of our distribution partners, um, we're just looking to get more ports in the ground. And it echoes what we go to, what, we've, what I've been hammering on the entire call, which is the 208 strategy and, you know, what's possible from our hardware, uh, you know, our hardware portfolio. Um, we're entirely interested in just looking at where we can get ports in the ground um, and creating the easiest path to do so on that. Sure. And that's certainly a... A strategy that is not widely accepted working with that. So I definitely think you all offer and have a, a, a slightly different competitive advantage when exploring that uh, availability. You've mentioned a couple of times that you you all manufacture your own equipment. You're not using outside suppliers. Is that, That's right. Correct. Yeah, we, we manufacture... Um, with contract manufacturing partners. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you have the ability to, of course, use it yourself, but then make that available for other networks to purchase, install, and operate their your equipment for their networks. Correct. Yeah, we can either go by way of what one would deem as a white, white label supply agreement, right? Where they're utilizing our hardware and 
you know, um, looking at installing that, um, similar to what you might find with Electrify America or um, EVgo, right? They're utilizing third-party hardware, mm -hmm. um, you know, or can just provide our solution out of the box as well. So outside of the hardware, when you say your solution, that's including an app, web page, software, back end, uh, analytics and data gathering, like what all do you mean by the total package there? Yeah, we have a basic software package that could be included out of the box um, that won't be able to manage other uh, chargers outside of X-Charge hardware. Um, but in the event that you are working with a, an entirely X-Charge stack, um, that would be something that you'd be able to operate, you know, the the hardware with or all the equipment um, has all the bells and whistles that you need to uh, get things done, plus, you know, a little bit more. Um, so it's actually quite a robust piece of software or quite a robust back end, but really focused on what, you know, capabilities we have from a hardware standpoint on that as well. Mm -hmm. And that's all the way from our C6 to our NZS to our C7 as well. Sure. I know we're running close to time. So before I end the episodes, I always like to ask my guests two questions. The first one is, what do you drive, whether it's an EV or not? Uh, I drive the rental car that's given to me at the rental facility. I live in beautiful Brooklyn, New York, and rely heavily on public transit around these parts. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, a <laughs> lot of my guests have been in the New York area and have had similar responses. And I'm like, Hey, that's, that's great. <laughs> but I do, when I rent, it's generally an EV. I have a, a trip planned uh, in about a month that I'm going to take a Tesla road trip from New York up to Maine. So oh, cool. very excited for that one. Didn't, didn't go with the bolt this time around, but <laughs> have done it in the past. My it, cat enjoys getting there uh, without too many stops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I will side note, if you happen to make your way through Bucksport, Maine, um, it's a very, really nice, quaint little community uh, right right on the, the waterfront. It's pretty, very, oh, nice. very beautiful. So the second question, which is the last question, is a play on the word drives. Not what do you drive, but what drives you? So when you wake up in the morning, what is the driving thought or purpose behind what makes Alex, Alex? Yeah. I mean, I, I think putting the effort in the ground, like physically and literally, right. Um, just knowing that each day, what I'm doing is creating a positive impact in some fashion or another and, you know, driving the infrastructure forward. I think that really has been, that's been driving me recently. Um, I think the challenge and logistical challenges of doing that, um, and getting to like the, just solving the problems. I love solving problems. So that's definitely what drives me in the overall process of things. Um, just creating these solutions and finding a way to get us to a, you know, to an electrified future together and a less, hopefully a less complicated way as well. Awesome. Well, Alex, before we end, if somebody wants to reach out or if they just want to follow along with what X charge is doing, what's the best way for them to do that? Absolutely. Follow us on LinkedIn, um, X charge North America on LinkedIn. We're very active there. Um, feel free to connect with me on there as well. Alex Urist. Um, I would definitely toss a follow to our president, Atish Patel as well. He's very active in his findings. He drives, you know, in, in Texas um, sees a lot of charging stations out there. We document pretty much everywhere we travel to as well and you know ongoing testing that we're doing with units. So definitely would uh, look out there um, and don't be a stranger. You know, feel free to to just reach out even if it's just to, to have a chat. I'm definitely pretty receptive on that front. So feel free to get there. And then xcharge.us uh, for our website. Okay. And that would be x-c-h-a-r-g-e dot u-s. Correct. Great. I'll make sure to have all the links displayed so that people can see the LinkedIn as well as the, the webpage itself as well. Beautiful. Well, Alex, I want to thank you for taking your time to come on the podcast and talk about what's going on uh, across the country with EV charging, because we could probably do this every other month and still have new things to talk about. It seems like Always it's something new. and evolving so quickly. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Really great to be here. Thank <laughs> you.
If you've enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please subscribe to wherever you like to watch or listen to your favorite podcasts. And if you're looking to stay plugged into the EV community, head over to ev-resource.com for the very best educational resources, community connections, EV reviews, and a whole lot more. The EV Resource Podcast is a production of EV Resource and is supported by viewers and listeners just like you. Members of the EV Resource Patreon family are, at the director tier, Rajiv Narayan and Andy Cooper, at the executive producer tier, Christopher Lawrence, and at the producer tier, Eric Weber and Tony Stunts. If you're interested in ad-free episodes of the podcast, EV Resource merchandise, support recognition, and more, head over to patreon.com slash EV Resource. If you have any feedback, please email hello at ev-resource.com and put podcast feedback in the subject line. I've been your host, Zach Hurst. Thank you so much for watching and listening, and we'll catch you next time.